Hello and welcome to this weekend's edition of the Weekend Market Brief. This is Sven Henrik from Northman Trader. Um, by the way, first of all, thank you here for all the positive feedback I keep getting on these videos. Glad you guys enjoy them. They're helpful for me as well, just to kind of run through the, the big picture and, and the charts. These are off the cuff, guys. Uh, there's no notes, uh, there's no script. I'm just walking through the charts as I've put them to, together and kind of give you my top of the head impression of everything. I'm titling this bubble, popping the bubble, um, because we're, we are in an asset bubble. And I, I keep talking about it in, in, in my writings and, and valuations and obviously in the action and the price action. The, the thing with bubbles is, what is a bubble? A bubble is when asset prices vastly exceed the economic basis for um, the, the prices that we actually see in, in assets. And, and you see a lot of one-way action. You see dramatic buying. You see you know greed. You, you see all these things as prices and momentum just keep exacerbating to the, to the upside. And in the recent decades, we've seen a lot of these bubbles be driven by one factor only, easy central bank money. That was certainly the case in 2000 in, in the lead up to Y2K. I've talked about that before when the Fed added a lot of liquidity um, in, in preparation for Y2K. This artificial liquidity just caused or helped further uh, create excess and imbalance. And then when the Fed reduced our liquidity in 2000, everything crashed. And then we got into a recession in 2007. You can argue the bubble was, the housing bubble was also generated mainly by the Fed through easy money that created the real estate bubble. And people got pushed, pushed into these um, mortgage-backed securities, uh, subprime loans. And then when the Fed, Fed rose, uh, raised rates, that popped the bubble at the time. And now we're in this mode of the biggest bubble of all time in, in many ways because central bank intervention doesn't stop. As I talked about in 2018, they, they tried and failed, and now they're back into providing just ungastly amounts of liquidity as, as we saw that. So the first par portion is really to understand or recognize that one is in, in a bubble, in, in, in the classic definition that asset prices are moving vastly above the economic basis, and I've written extensively about that. What's interesting here is that you know, now we finally see actually one point of recognition um, or admission, if, if you will. I talked about this yesterday in, in, in the ghosts of 2000. And, you know, I, I, I encourage you all, and I think I know many of you are, are reading these pieces, but in, in case you're new to these videos, you know, keep checking for um, write-ups on, on the website because I'm trying to my best here to document reality. And this is the thing, you know, in, in, when you're in bubbles, you will find invariably the, the, the majority trying to find ways to justify the price action via fundamentals. And and we see that now again as well. This is this permanent, you know, keep keep pushing, keep pushing, keep raising in target prices and find justifications for what is ultimately not justifiable. But this week, big admission here. This is Dallas Fed President Kaplan. I talked about this yesterday. I just have to read this out. I do think the growth in, in the balance sheet is having some impact on the financial markets and on the valuation of risk assets. I want to be cognizant of not adding more fuel that could help create further excesses and imbalances. This is a huge statement. First of all, he, I think he's been a little coy by saying having some impact. The fact is, you know, we have a complete correlation here between the balance sheet expansion since uh, the end of September for over $400 billion and, and the S&P completely ripped it, uh, you know, the market higher on that front and continues to do so to this day. But the admission that the growth in the balance sheet is having impact on the financial markets and the valuation of risk assets is huge. We've not gotten that admission from any of the chairs of central banks across the world, not from Draghi at the time, not from Yellen, not from uh, Bernard Ankin, certainly not from Powell. So these guys know that's uh, it's it's it has to be, it can't be overstated how important this is. They know what they're doing with the balance sheet is impacting financial markets. This is obviously what I've been saying. That's what a lot of other people are saying now too. So the, the point is that what we see in asset prices, what we see in levels, what we see in behavior of markets 
is not natural, it has nothing to do with fundamentals. That's, that's, the, that's the entire issue why we saw this big blast up in markets last year. You know, initially, obviously, we had this technical um, oversold readings at the end of December of 2018, and we had to have a, a reconnect with, with, you know, all the imbalances that were created to the downside. That made sense. Then, of course, we had this whole issue about rate cuts and easing, blah, 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 blah. It was not until the balance sheet was increased that markets flew up to the higher to the upside. So why is this so important? Because what you're seeing in asset prices now is not reflective of fundamentals, not reflective of the economy. It's a bubble, okay? And so when he says, I want to be cognizant of not adding more fuel that could help create further excesses and imbalances, that's an acknowledgement that we already have excesses and imbalances, which is obviously what I've been writing about as well. So the Fed knows, okay? And the reason, again, they're all doing this, and this is the important point here, is they're doing this because they're dealing with the overnight rates and the entire repo operation that they have going on top of buying treasury bills. It just keeps adding liquidity to the market that's creating excess and imbalances and balances. So it's massively important to recognize this. And so obviously, this is where we are. This has been the big run since the balance sheet expansion. And to the extent that this is all artificial, then none of this is real, right? So you, you're running the risk that at some point, this all reverses uh, and creates a rebalance. Now, and I'm going to talk about this before in terms of bubbles in past and how we can recognize when things change, because that's the big question. When is it going to change? When is it going to end? How do we know it's going to end? And when do we get some sort of rebalance of it all? So let's go through the charts. And I think you find this interesting. First of all, recognizing this is 2020 so far. Fascinating. We are seeing some two-way price action. Um, and obviously, the big story this week was this massive reversal that we saw off of the Iran mini-crisis, right? No crisis lasts more for, for a few hours. And and yes, while well, the focus was on this massive ramp up, I think what got lost in the shovel here, shuffle here on, on the news front is how quickly the bid disappeared again. Okay, this this... These moves were fast, right? And they're fairly sizable, right? We were at 32.50 roughly, and then we ended up at 31.80. So, you know, 70, it was about 800 points on the Dow, just just straight down again. And then, of course, the, the big safe again, coming again with a tweet, right? All is well by President Trump, and everybody's just trying to keep things calm. And it's good that they're keeping things calm. We don't, we don't want a world war or any war in, in the Middle East. We've been through this before. It's messy, it's unpredictable. And, and so far. So, but what you see, and this is also common in bubbles, is see you see this complete indiscriminate buying. This is here on the, on the on the Nasdaq, just absolute panic buying. In fact, Jim Cramer mentioned that this week, right? Complete desperation to get in. Uh, that this is where no one cares about value valuations or, or what have you. And this is how when, you know, when you have this excess liquidity environment. Um, this is what what happens, and certainly, you know, I've gotten surprised by by all this. Um, you know, when the Fed came out in October and said, "Hey, it's not QE," well, it was a straight out lie, because they know it's creating uh, and it's impacting asset prices and creating imbalances. So, you know, now we're in this bubble. You have to just deal with that and and recognize it. Now, let's look at the charts. This is the NYSE. I showed that last week. This wedge it continues to run. We had that little dip. And by the way, not, none of the downside action you saw uh, uh, this week is, is visible in the cash charts, right? Because this actually broke in the middle of the night, but it was saved by the morning. And this is the kind of action that keeps breeding complacency. Yeah, I don't have to worry about downside. It'll all be fixed by the morning. Or even if we open down, we'll be green first thing in the morning. That's why there's there's no demand for protection. I mean, this is the most unprotected market in in many 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 years. There's on, look at put call ratios. You hardly see anyone having any protection on. So we have this really steep wedge. Uh, we have this trend that's not broken at the moment. But you start looking at some signals. You know these new highs here came on negative divergences, and I'll talk about this. A little bit later. Also, of note, there's the Dow as an example. 
we we did get some reversal on on friday and that is a outside reversal candle whether that means anything at this point yet remains to be seen but it's certainly a potential warning sign out there and so this this is one way of looking at this you know we've had multiple runs like this in the last couple of years where volatility gets extremely compressed markets get overbought and then you know you see often these negative divergences and right at the time when everybody's most complacent boom right this is what we had in in, in january of 2018 here we are in january 2020 and vix is basically at the same level what crisis right 12.56 the vix closed on friday again and that's interesting because you know while we had a down day on friday volatility didn't move at all so this pattern that i've talked about is still very much in in play vix remains compressed vol uh, complacency remains high uh, you know if we had to do a, a replay this is kind of your 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 risk zone right i mean 10 percent correction from here gets you right into 29.57 so you you're looking at the 200 ma not saying it will happen what i'm saying is that based on the previous rallies of this magnitude with similar setups that's kind of what you had a quick 10 percent drop and i'm what i mean by quick quick you know this is where you kind of give it all back now of course you can argue this you know support before that and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later but basically here is the the vix structural chart i pointed out this week in vix 46 you know we're still in this compression pattern and as long as liquidity remains in control you know this this can drag out obviously um the question is when do we see this breakout in in volatility coming that may get us a spike as high as there right because these things tend to come out of the blue following these compression patterns interesting note here too here's the vix vis-a-vis -vis the s p things are calm we've had this liquidity rally there is a big gap here and at some point we will want to see some realignment of 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 some sort so i remain on the on the wagon that we're going to see a major volatility spike in 2020 question is when just the lay of the land here um as people are still ferociously buying every single dip keep in mind there's no signs of a bottom to buy all right we are not corrected market hasn't corrected and and little downside action overnight even if it's an 800 point drop in the dow is not a bottom in in, in a technical sense right here's the nylo high low high low index for the nice and it's cooking i mean it's it's very much in the in the overbought range and typically when when you're there you at least get a smaller pullback of of some sort um but obviously haven't seen this this is the asset manager exposure index and uh, you see that they're still very much long um, what you do see sometimes is you, you see these pokes higher and then um, markets can still rally but they are already reducing exposure a little bit but they're still very much exposed and then when they're very much exposed you tend to get some sort of pullback or even larger correction interesting observation here in the lead up to 2018 on the tax cuts massively exposed on the long side but then they reduced right into the end of the year in a big way but markets kept rallying but that was our so this this was the momentum back then that was just ongoing um so this alone does not tell you you have a top in it can still keep rallying but it's 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 a sign to be weary of that asset managers are very much long exposed post here nymo this is very interesting you know new all-time highs again on friday new all-time highs uh, several times this this week and yet nymo minus five in fact you see this massive reversal here the, the the readings are weakening 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 and this is kind of what we've seen before as well right you you, you see these rallies on these wedges and channels that they keep making new highs but nymo is getting weaker and weaker and then some of these highs are coming on negative readings that's kind of what we're seeing here now uh, we even saw this here again in 2018 right we had a massive rally but it got kept getting weaker we had that here in, in september 
I should have probably adjusted the charts, but you get the point. You know, you, you have marginal highs coming on negative NIMO readings and then the channel breaks. So I'm just pointing this one out that this is the same setup that we're starting to see unfold here as well. And here's the weekly chart. There was one misreading here. This was in, uh, in the fall when we had this other massive blow up rally into the end of the year. Uh, where NIMO went negative, but every everyone else you can see, right, once it stops negative, any of these highs are highly questionable and they lead to some sort of correction. We even saw this last year, right? Here's the uh, the March run into April, went negative, and then two weeks later, down, went negative, two weeks later, down. So I'm just pointing out that this is very similar here at this point. We obviously seeing negative readings now emerge on NIMO. Let's go through some of the index charts that I always highlight, you know, for signs, if you will. Here's the BKX again. It actually broke its uptrend this week, didn't make new highs. And, and keep in mind, BKX never made a new high vis-a-vis -vis 2018. The yield equation remains a mystery to me. I mean, if, if, if any of this price action is justifying by green shoots in the economy, that bond market is not sending that signal at all. This is a channel. If that breaks to the downside, then obviously we're going to have perhaps a retest of the lows and yields um, that everybody's now declaring to be no longer an issue. We'll, we'll find out. Here's the small caps. Small caps did not make a new high in 2020 vis-a-vis -vis 2019, so far anyway. So again, notable underperformance. And of course, small caps have never made a new high vis-a-vis -vis 2018. So to me, this still remains a big question mark, especially considering if this is simply the Fed printing money, then small caps have yet to confirm anything. The same with transports that I keep pointing out. Again, no new highs, not even out of the range at all. So where does this leave us? And this is why I want to get into this whole bubble notion. Um, here's Apple, and just to point out that, and just to recognize that we're at massive extremes here, okay? Weekly RSI of 89. Historic precedents in recent years, zero. This is a massively, massively overbought stock, and as I pointed out last week, you know, you, you, you get these aggressive moves. And this is now higher than 2012 in terms of the overbought reading. Back then, we had a, a pullback, a sizable pullback, that then led to new highs that produced a negative divergence, and then we had a massive correction, right? So you can envision that something similar could be happening or setting up here as well. Bottom line is the stock has added almost $600 billion in market cap since the revenue warning here, and it, not justifiable by, by growth at this point. You know, Apple has a, a great story in terms of 5G, perhaps, but at this point, all this growth story remains unproven. And so while people keep upgrading the stock, you know, we have an earnings report coming up very shortly. And I think that earnings report will at least shed some light in terms of how much of this is actually justified or not. But just recognize this has been indiscriminate buying week after week after week after week after week. There's, there's absolutely no sense of risk value, valuation whatsoever, just get me into the stock. These are massive market cap moves that are taking place here. And so when you look at the NASDAQ, obviously similar to what we, I showed earlier in the NICE, just a steady channel up, uh, even tried to poke above it uh, this week on this indiscriminate buying, but on a negative divergence again. So caution. That's what that's telling me. And so what I want to do now is kind of walk you through some lessons from bubbles past, right? Because just because they're buying doesn't know doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. I mean, we've seen that what a few times. Here's I'm just using this example here as a, a well known one, the the 1987 example. I mean, just a massive ramp up. What what are the commonalities here in these bubbles? You you see massive aggressive buying, you see disconnects, uh, vast disconnects from the moving averages. Um, then invariably, especially like early in the year, you get a uh, negative divergence again. This is why I keep pointing them out. They're just really important, right? When you get new highs and negative divergences, you tend to get downside. They're a signal of, of something. 
And then variable, what you get is a, a move back, a reconnect to the 50 MA, or the lower daily ball in Japan, and then another blast off, and then another negative divergence. And then suddenly it can disappear in just a blink of an eye in a, in a matter of days. And that this is what I think we all need to be cognizant of, that you, you get to a point of indiscriminate buying where something triggers and then it's all over. So, you know, to the you know, you, if, if you look at this chart till here, you see absolutely no problems in, in, in the future, right? But then something happens. And this brings me back to this 2000 example because we're seeing so much on the valuation side that is so incredibly similar. Uh, and, and the disconnects that we see in asset prices vis a vis the underlying economy. What was 2000? Well, in 1998, we had a 20% correction and we had a basically, a, you know, a ramp into 1999 very steady throughout the entire year but that's this is where the fed came in right with this y2k liquidity and then everything blasted off and we had this massive run up and then again negative divergences produced pullbacks and that was a reconnect with the 50 ma and another blast higher and then everything fell apart right i mean we all know the story and it didn't end until the end of 2003 because this ultimately this reversal in asset prices impacted the economy back then already and impacted consumer confidence and, and and everything else and this is where officially the recession started right after the damage in equity prices um so be very mindful of that and so you know what you can do now is actually not only in context of valuations and economic disconnects you can observe along with the fed adding liquidity back then doing the same thing now you can see similar behavior here right this was in october this is when everything blasted higher and if you compare these periods it's kind of interesting so this is this is what we have now this is from october just this massive ramp up and this is what we had back then you know you, obviously percentage wise this was even more aggressive than what we see now but in terms of the you know the the lineal performance it's it's very similar in, in in structure you know you had a, even a little december pullback or yeah early december late november pullback very similar you get this blast then you have a little pullback and another blast and that, that's kind of what we're seeing now but you know, if you take that in, in context you know what what this what happened then is obviously we had a reconnect with the 50 ma and we may well see that here now that that is clearly the risk here and that that would be a sizable move right it, it kind of takes out that excess and then you can get another blast higher and then obviously what you what you want to look for is a negative divergence back then we had a negative divergence on on new highs we have these now as well nothing is like for like in every aspect but in terms of the, the basic structure, you, you have a very similar setup here. So what would one could argue is that when you know, look at well, how does this end on what's happening next, you know, you, you are, we're always at risk of a quick reversion down um, that could get us to the lower daily Bollinger Band and to the 50 MA. And then you can have another massive blast of rally into march april which makes sense because in a way you can argue the fed absolutely remains in control and unless until that changes and until you see signs that the liquidity equation can no longer control asset prices as now acknowledged by the fed itself thank you very much as long as that remains the case uh rally momentum remains in play now the fed originally said well we're going to stop the repo you know it's going to be a few weeks and they extend it to the end of the year and now they're going to say they did set to the end of january but already we hear voices saying well we're going to extend it to april <clears throat> so they have a problem they they recognize they've blasted asset prices higher so they know that there's a relationship they know that if they just pull back tomorrow that relationship with demand that we're going to see a massive reversion that reversion would be a threat to the economy right because asset prices and the economy are very much interlinked these days so uh, their problem is to recognize that they now that they've recognized and admitted 
that they've blown this higher, how are they going to extract themselves from that without causing damage? I think that's the challenge for the Fed um, and, and it's a challenge for, for all of us, right? Because we, we are in this artificial construct and we have these overlords that are trying to keep control of the asset price equation. So, you know, to me, it's a matter of the Fed ever being able to control the asset price equation and preventing any damage. And so far, I hate to admit it, they continue to do so uh, marvelously, but ultimately, I think this is going to be ending in disaster because you, you can you can run extended asset bubbles only for so long. The, the, the danger for all of us, obviously, is you know how crazy can this get? And right now, clearly, buyers are in crazy mode. Right? They they buy bid everything up with no sense of regard for safety protection value or valuation but basically this is a historic script that kind of tells you how this could play possibly and then we need to keep, keep an eye on so how high can this go well I'm, I'm obviously trying to keep a technical eye on everything and this was interesting to me this week because if you take the and i always like to look at fibs in different constellations and this was the july high and this was the august low and that gives us a 1.618 FIB at 31.85. Well, guess what? We ramped into there late in the year. We tagged it, and that was a reversion right on that FIB, very precise. So it did at least respect that FIB for a little bit, for a week, if you will. <laughs> and then before blasting above it and kept going higher, we got close to the upper weekly Bollinger Band this week before rejecting. Saved the uh, weekly 5 EMA, but that low that happened in the middle of the night, guess what? It, it stopped right here at that FIB. It became support. So as long as that FIB remains support, so 3185 is a key level. As long as that remains support, this can keep going higher. So how much further can this go? Well, as long as this holds support, the next FIB level is at 34.37. Does that mean I'm bullish? No, but it's a cognizant, a technical recognition that this is how high can this can go. You know, this is obviously not inconsistent with a lot of the Wall Street targets that we see uh, for the end of year of, of, of 2020. So I think everybody bull bear needs to be cognizant of this. Uh, and this is the key line in, in, in the sand. So, you know, from my perspective, the, the, what we need to see, or what bears need to see, rather, is a break below the weekly 5 EMA to start with, one that sticks. And notice it has held at the end of each week, and every dip below it has been bought so, so far. So the trend is intact. This is intact. First thing that needs to happen, a weekly close below this and a close below that. Then you can tackle some of these other MAs that are vastly disconnected at this point. And here's the weekly chart, and I'll just finish off with a couple of charts here. This is the weekly chart that kind of highlights, again, the, the point. Not only was the 3185, 1.6618 FIB held, this trend line was saved by the end of the week as well. Right? This is the trend that was initially broken, then was recaptured, but now has been also holding a support. So that needs to break, uh, along with that weekly five EMA that I mentioned before as well. At the same time, I'm going to keep pointing this out as well, as, as extended as these markets are, uh, they're always at risk of a quick reversion that could be sizable, right? I mean, we saw that obviously here. We saw this here. Hasn't happened yet, but to me, this is kind of the larger risk zone on any type of reversion. But... Here we also have this trend support. So, you know, any any correction may be lesser than that. Uh, may stop around here, 3,100. And, of course, we have these previous highs, 30, 28, and, and so forth. So there's a lot of support in these in these areas. So you may also see something in this range at some point and then another blast higher per the 2,000 script. And here's the daily chart, again, highlighting the point. Super tight channel. Um, not broken. We had a reversal candle on Friday because obviously ES started exceeding the daily Bollinger Band. Uh, that's always a warning sign, right? Along with this outside candle on on the Dow, 
when you get a rejection candle like that always keen to watch out if that produces something larger so again this entire range here is fair game if we were to get a sizable correction we have next week we have obviously the signing of the ever elusive china deal they've been very coy about this you know president xi is not showing up his name is not even on the document i'm sorry if you're proud about a deal that you have negotiated you would want to be there and you would want to sign it he's not he's not showing up he's sending his lieutenant we still don't know what's actually in the deal nobody knows because they've been as i said very coy about it now if there's going to be this great reveal on wednesday then fine then show it but if it's such a great reveal why is president of china not showing up because it's not a big deal i i think this is this is the gamesmanship that we see coming out of the administration you know you create a crisis then you half fix the crisis and claim victory i mean this is how this this goes it's a big marketing game and then of course phase two is now you know dragged out into god knows when and trump said this week that you know he may not do a phase two deal until after the election well duh not been able to actually accomplish anything on 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 the substance on the deal and and so you know it's kind of the carrot that you keep dangling so we'll find out this week i mean if if there's really no because look at the end of the day it comes down to ceo confidence uh, what's been dragging is capital investments business investments and so forth because there's no clarity there's no visibility there's no certainty of any sort so if you now have a phase one deal that has very little substance to it does that remove any of the uncertainty for ceos to say well now we're going to invest big time now we're going to raise capital investments we'll find out this week be interesting to see if this is going to be a trigger of some sort of course we have opex uh, as well impeachment is still out there but it has had zero impact obviously on on equity prices and it may not at all um so we'll, we'll find out i think this week will be interesting again where we remain massively stretched we had new highs on negative divergences we have panic buying we have charts that are extremely extremely stretched and disconnected i remain of the view that any strength here is kind of a opportunity to sell uh for when when the turn comes it would come probably extremely quickly and we saw a glimmer of that this week as the bid disappeared out of the blue anyway we are in bubble mode and the bubble will go on until it pops and uh we we saw from the historical script how that may unfold so i hope this was all helpful for you guys and uh, thanks again for your attention and, and support and uh i'll catch you guys on twitter thanks